Okay, I think it's time to get going. Um, it's been a lot of effort in uh, the XDP world to facilitate not only uh, making it useful in terms of passing around information like metadata and whatever, but also the most important reason that we implemented it, which was performance. And one area that's important for performance it can be bulk processing. So that's a topic that Mache is gonna, from Intel is gonna discuss. Uh, please give him a round of applause. So, oh, the mic is on, I need to watch my language. Um, okay, so my name is Maciej Fiokowski, and I'm here to talk about XDP bulk packet processing. Um, and at first, um, let's ask ourselves how can we apply the batching to the XDP processing pipeline? Are there any places that we could do that? Um, because as we know, the, and as Dave said, batching can improve the software performance in a significant way. So what if we would be batching the XDP buffers in the driver and we would be passing it um, to the XDP program? So we would have only a single call to the XDP program and the XDP program would be iterating over those frames. Um, so it turns out that um, the results are pretty good, or I would say great, um, because from what I saw um, on my setup, um, I had even two times bigger performance for the TX, almost two times bigger, for the TX and the redirect case uh, actions. Um, so the test setup was that I had the Ford Bill 10 gig um, cards, which were using the i40 driver um, with um, some changes that I was mentioning. Um, and there were no particular performance specific settings. Um, it was just the 5.3 kernel where it uh, Red Pauline turned on. Um, so, um, Having said that, um, let's go over to the agenda of this talk. At first, let's have a few more words about the source of performance improvements. And um, then I'm gonna talk about the POC itself. Um, it consists of two parts. Um, there are driver changes um, and the eBPF verifier changes because we need to enable the um, BPF program to walk over the array of XDP buffs. Um, and there are some things yet still to be solved because um, it's still work in progress. Um, there are some also questions of, on my thoughts on this. So as I said, um, the source of performance improvements come from bulking. And to be more specific, if um, bulking utilizes the instruction cache in a much better way, I see that my slides are broken a bit because I was doing it on the windows, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but anyway, you get the idea. So we are, we, we are doing the bulking we're making a better use of the instruction cache um, because there's a big chance that if you are the processing the X plus one element from the array, um, there is a um, big chance that um, the instructions for its processing are, are already in the cache because you are just processing the X element. Um, the second thing, um, that improves the performance is that we have less indirect calls because the XDP program is called only once, not per each um, XDP buff. Um, so in case where you have the standard NAPI budget of 64, there are um, 63 less indirect calls um, in that approach. So, um, we can, before we start 
talking about the driver changes. Um, there's a thing that right now the driver is relying on what the XDP program returns, right? So we look up the um, return value of the XDP program and we know what action should be taken on the XDP buff. And with such approach, we lose this ability to, um, basically, we don't know what to do with each XDP buff from the array that um, BPF program have processed, right? So um, there are two approaches that I've considered. Um, one would be that um, we extend the XDP buff with new field called act, and the BPF program would be writing the return value to this field. Um, and the second approach is that um, we would be passing the whole array to be filled um, as a standalone argument. Um, but from my short performance tests, I saw that the second approach was a bit worse. So I took the first one, which is more naive, I would say. But the rest of this talk would be focused on the first approach presented here. So um, uh, I think that I already said that, but here we have um, what is going on on the driver side. So the XDP program would be fed with um, the whole XDP buff array. And then after uh, the XDP program would end its job, um, we would be looking at the um, act field, which was set by the BPF program. So um, this is the simplified pseudocode of the whole new clean receive interrupt that I um, provided. Um, so we can divide it onto three stages. The, the first one is that um, we are working over the um, receive descriptors um, and look for the frames that are ready to be processed. And we basically set the um, XDP buffers um, from the XDP buff array. Um, then on the second stage, we would have only a single XDP program, as I said, um, where we will be passing the XDP buffs array. So after that, the third stage will be um, going over the array and look for the XDP act field that we introduced. Um, so um, the eBPF changes um, are cons consisting of basically enabling um, the BPF program to walk over the array of XDP buffs. So I will be referring to this as a trampoline. Um, oh, it's broken really bad. But anyway, um, on the left side, um, we see that um, there's a BPF program that came from user space. Um, and it was compiled with um, Clank, and right now we can compile it with GCC as well. So it's represented in the BPF assembly, and in that representation, the eBPF verifier works on this. Um, and if the verifier tells us that the program is safe, um, we would be generating the trampoline. Um, and the trampoline consists of two parts. Um, there's a prologue and the epilogue section. And the, the prologue would be placed um, before the first instruction of the BPF program. And the epilogue would be placed before 
the second last, uh, sorry, between the second last and last instructions. Um, there's a reason for this, um, which I will um, explain later. And then um, program in such form um, is jitted onto the machine code of the underlying CPU architecture. And then we attach it to the NIC. And um, the little ch JIT change will also be required beside the verifier changes. Um, okay, so before going over to the um, describing the prolog and epilog section in a detailed way, um, let's um, tell us um, what's the purpose of particular eBPF registers. So we are interested in the R0 because it is holding the return value of the program and we will be storing this register to the act field that we introduced per each um, XDP buff from the array. The next thing is that the R1 is holding the XDP buff pointer, um, which is also important uh, to us. Um, and then the R10 is of our interest because we will be making use of the BPF stack. And let me tell you why. Oh, it's the next slide, sorry. Um, but that's the um, uh, eBPF program layout after we generate the trampoline. So um, as you can see, the, the, the prolog section consists only of three instructions. Um, and it will be, uh, sorry, it will be executed only once. Um, on the other hand, the epilogue section will be executed on each um, iteration of the loop that BPF program would take. So, and it's a bit longer, but I will talk about it later. Um, so the, the, the trampoline section, um, at first um, we are um, initializing our loop counter and then we are storing it to, to the BPF stack um, because we need to be able to refer to that value from the epilog section and there's no guarantee that um, a BPF registers wouldn't be overwritten by the program itself. And we need to do another thing with the XDP buff pointer, so the initial R1 content, to be able to basically iterate over the XDP buff array. So um, with stack usage, there comes some responsibility. Um, basically, um, we need to go over the instructions from the initial PPF program um, and um, basically offset them with the 12 bytes that we are consuming from the BPF stack. So the, the, the first thing um, that we should look for is um, the store or load operations where the R10 is, um, is, used, is used as a source or destination register. And the second thing is that um, you might have a um, BPF helper function call where you set up um, a particular register to be pointing to the variable on the stack. So um, we need to look for the operations where the uh, R10 is stored onto another register and then um, there is an LAU operation on such register so that the register became become the pointer to stack. Um, so we need to offset, the, offset them with the 12 bytes. Um, so our um, our values that we pushed on the prolog um, wouldn't get overwritten by the program. Um, so 
I was also mentioning that um, there is a needed JIT change, and we need to um, subtract the stack pointer so that we make um, a space for our two variables. Um, and if we wouldn't do that, um, I had a situation where I was overwriting the driver's uh, stack variables if, if I wasn't doing it. So um, it's, it's here, it's, um, we are subtracting the 16 because the verifier, um, sorry, the JIT for the x86 is rounding up the recorded stack depth up to um, eight. So this is an example of the program where there was no stack usage, but we need to anyway round up the 12 bytes to 16. I don't know why it is that, but I kept it that way. Um, so this is the um, epilog section. Um, so um, I was telling you that there was a reason why we patch it between two last instructions. Um, and the second last instruction is um, usually the one that is initializing the R0. So after that instruction, we know what the return value is. But the case is that um, it could be the return, for example, xdptx, but it can also be the um, return BPF redirect map. So it's a BPF helper call which is uh, using the R1 and R2 as its arguments. So if we have load our um, loop counter and XDP buff from the stack, we would override the R1 and R2, and we basically broke the call to the BPF redirect map. So um, these are the first two instructions of um, the epilogue section. So uh, we load the R1 and R2 um, with our uh, XDP buff pointer and the loop counter. Um, so once we have the XDP buff in the R1, we are good to store the R0 and I see that I have a bug in my slide. This should be the act, not redval. I was changing the name for this field. But anyway, the third instruction is the one that um, is storing the return value under the XDP buff that was being processed by the program. And then we are good to go with going to the um, next entry of the XDP buff array. So we just add the size of struct XDP buff to the R1, and we end up with um, R1 pointing to the next um, element of the array. And basically, that's the whole idea of this. We will be going over in a loop in the BPF program, and we will be basically um, pushing the R1 to the next um, XDP buffs. So, um, after that, we would uh, bump our loop counter. Um, then we, are, we would store back to the stack um, the values, the, the updated values of counter and XDP buff, so that on the next iteration of the loop, um, we would be looking at the value from the previous loop, you get it. Um, and the last instruction um, is the one that is comparing the um, loop counter against the 64. I have it um, as a immediate value right now um, because the 64 is a, sorry, 64 is a size of our 
um, XDP bus array. And it seems that the performance was better to uh, compare it against the immediate value instead of um, having basically providing the size um, or count of the frames um, that the, the driver has filled onto the XDP buffs and loading it up onto this instruction uh, to be compared against the um, loop counter. So um, to sum this up, um, at first, um, there are some things to be solved. Um, so the, the first one I have listed as um, the prefetch instruction in the BPF assembly because just like we lost the ability to um, know the return value per each um, XDP buff, we can't right now prefetch all of the XDP buffs, right? We can just prefetch the um, first entry from the array. So um, the, the, the perf was showing that the first um, instruction that was accessing actually the XDP data um, was pretty expensive. So I think that it makes sense to have a um, prefetch in a BPF assembly that would be later um, jitted onto the machine code. And the next thing is that um, the self-tests are broken. They need to be um, taken care of. Um, the, the third um, thing, and we start with a question. Um, so how do we um, distinguish between the driver that is able to provide the XDP buff array and uh, the one that is not? Because we, we can't um, do a thing where we would be always um, generating the trampoline because we would be hurting the performance for the drivers that are um, still processing the XDP buffs one by one. So um, this needs to be solved as well. Um, another question is whether um, processing the actions in the sorted way so that we would be, for example, processing all of the XDP drops, then all of the XDP TXs and so on, um, would it also make a better performance? Um, the next question is that, will AFXDP benefit from it? Because I was only focusing this um, work on the standard XDP. And I have some thoughts on this. Um, basically, in my opinion, the driver changes are required. We need to step away from the one-by-one -one processing, but instead act on the batches of data. Um, I think that um, without driver changes, the um, performance wouldn't be so good as, as it is. Um, and um, in my opinion, we need to have this implemented in one way or another because the TX and 3 direct boost is speaking for itself. And basically, this was um, some proposed implementation of this. Let's do the Q&A. For bulk process, okay. I can totally see the need for bulk processing, but I'm wondering um, why you went the route of uh, changing the the jitted program instead of just running the same jitted program in a loop. It's not the. It's uh, the changes um, a bit earlier than the jitted program. Um, we are doing it in the BPF assembly. Right, Be before right, yeah, but why, why can't you simply run the existing program 
multiple times on because successive it's elements a, of the array. It's an indirect call to the program, right? So he's he's getting rid of that indirection. So you process sixteen packets, you don't do sixteen red pralines. Yeah, and that's I guess is the one part where um, the performance boost is coming from, right? You just have a single call, single indirect call, per each NAPI budget, instead of 64 calls. So the, uh, I, I was showing this on, uh, I would say, this slide, right? You basically have a single XDP program call. Two questions. First one is if you're going to, if you have to change the driver and you have to change the, the digit code, why not change the API? You're already changing the structure. Why not just change the API and make the normal call the trivial of one? But um, Th this might be less incremental because I was watching his presentation. I was thinking what you could do is not bulk when the device doesn't support the bulking infrastructure. And yeah, this, exactly. This, and if you change the API, that's kind of imposing it on everyone all at once. Whereas you could do it incrementally if you do it. His approach is my understanding. Could you always pass a single element? So, so the the best thing would be you. If he you has would, to decide which way to. But you'd have the loop to overhead. To rewrite the program or not before we push it down to the device. That's the problem. So the best way would be to maybe have some other layer where it would be gathering the XDP buffs. So you could do a software bulking layer, Zero. something like this, that understands the new format mm -hmm. until the driver is converted to the direct and, thing. And then the second question was, the you kept two variables, and you said when you used an immediate, it was faster than when you used a counter. Would it be faster to use one ver an end pointer so you only had one store and one load, and then a comparison against a, a register. You can't That's put anything in register across the program execution because they, they all get uh, uh, Understood, but you'd have one store and one load instead oh. of storing a counter and a pointer. Oh, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And that might offset the you advantage of the immediate. It could be. I agree. Yeah. Um, one thing is with this book processing, your returning a redirect action every packet. Mm -hmm. But um, if I recall correctly, the redirect BPF program actually stores internal state somewhere. And that internal state is then read later, like in CPU map. So I think that Jesper can answer this. <laughs> but yeah, um, are you talking so, about the dev map or yeah, I also about bulking? How how, how did you solve that? <laughs> I think what I think to solve something like that, you're going to have to go back to the other design where instead of booking up the XDP buff state, you're going to have another separate erase state where like if you're forwarding or redirecting, all of that internal state will be kept in that ring. Mm -hmm. that way, I think you're going to have to go to that approach. Yeah, so I'm not sure you handled the redirect correctly. Why? Be be because we have a per CPU store, so the redirect writes something into to the index. Yeah, and, and BPF and redirect info, right? And, and then afterwards we, we do, oh, if okay. we do so redirect. One, one, I, I will, yeah, the, the redirect might be broken a bit. I was. Yeah, but um, I was looking. I hadn't much, hadn't have much time, but I was looking lately at the perf reports of the redirect, and um, it was kind of broken because the do XDP redirect slow was appearing. So I don't know why. But, but yeah, that, but if if sorry. So, can we, can so we it, talk it, about it, this? It, it falls back to, to the non map version if it sees that it. Uh, the cookie like, doesn't yeah, match. But it, it was. Even that, it was uh, a lot faster, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, did I understand correctly that uh, your epilogue uh, assumes that the BPF program ends with the return statement and there are no uh, returns in the middle of the program? Um, so, yeah, but um, even if you have the return at the middle of the program, um, it would be in the BPF assembly, um, the jump to the second last instruction. That is what it looks like in the verify. So that's why I can base it on, on this. Yeah, okay, that's, um, uh, that's the code that I saw generated by CLang, but uh, I myself was able to feed uh, the BPF program with multiple exit instructions into the verifier, and I think it worked. Okay, so. So, um, I mean, yeah, if I write the BPF uh, assembly code manually, just like uh, we have in libbpf for AFXDP, uh, it's, still, uh, it's still validated correctly <coughs> by the verifier. Okay. And we can end up with multiple exit instructions. So either we have to enforce this requirement in validator mm -hmm. or invent something else. Yeah, possibly, yeah. But yeah, I, I was basing it on the samples from the kernel directory, so they were acting like this, all of them. Could, can I see the structure definition again? Um, the, ch the change in the... Sorry? Yeah, where you added the return code. Yeah. So t Sorry, this is a pet peeve, but we lost four bytes at the end of the structure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it was a naive approach, as I said. So to get back to the earlier question, um, the JIT compiler should just handle it fine because it, like all the exit paths jump to the epilogue at the end, so you could insert yourself right before that. So I think... In the JIT. It should be handled transparently from the JIT side, even. So, um, okay. But I, I was taking this part in order not to mess with every JIT. So I thought that maybe it would be possible in the okay. um, BPF assembly, right? So that then I get the generated JIT. I had another question that goes back to one of the other ones like instead of rewriting the program, but someone who has b a better understanding of how exactly indirect calls work, is it possible to do the indirect pointer to the program to dereference that and then call it in a loop? Or will that, that be rewritten with a red polling every time? And if we know mm -hmm. that we will sort of do the, the speculation magic um, once, but then just re-jump re to the same point multiple times, can we do that? Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if, I mean, we don't change XDP programs all that often. Why don't we just binary patch the kernel with a static jump? Like, we have jump labels and all that. Can't we just statically jump instead of doing indirect jumps? Well, we kind of do that. We have this uh, if statement tree thing with a macro right now for, like, protocol ops and stuff. Right, but, but the, that's these not are, here, these right? Are totally Yeah. Ooh, that's cool. Can we do that? I think, I think <laughs> we can. I mean, that should also resolve the actual web pooling that you have when you jump into the very first time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so and the like unary non batching execution would help as well. Yeah. yeah but like, and if this speed up is coming from avoiding the indirect call, then maybe we just solve it that way. Maybe. It's something to look into for sure. It needs to be measured. Yeah. But like, on the other thing, uh, so the, the thing about patching the return code, we'll also be doing that tomorrow. So <laughs> if we continue with this, we need to have it compatible because what, what we want to do is also chain different programs. So 
that might also be interesting with those bulking things. So chaining programs and then bulking them. <laughs> yes, exactly. So so we can do like a whole call tree that we, yeah. <laughs> It'll be fun. Oh. I don't know how this plays with tail calls or BPF function calls, but instead of having to rewrite all the stack accesses, could we just reserve some space at the end of the stack, the bottom of the stack, to store the metadata? We that can. You for the booking? We can, yeah, but I was short on time. And, uh, Doesn't you know, it, the, the verifier analyzes the stack uses of the program and only allocates the largest, so we could just add 12 or whatever to the end, right? Okay, so it's definitely doable. On the thought section, one of the things you did, you presumed that you had the 64 packets. One of the things you have to deal with is being able to time out if you're short of 64 packets. So one of the things you're gonna have to worry about at some point is draining when you're short of a full um, mapper load. Yeah. Um, right now I was just, um, <laughs> I wonder whether uh, instead of doing such rewriting and like uh, doing all that gymnastics, whether it wouldn't be better to just introduce a new kind of XDB programs that just ex uh, expects an array of XDB buffs and uh, I don't but know, you would have just to have a flag or something, and if uh, for backwards compatibility, if the, the old callback is provided or the old program is just called in loop with all the performance penalty. But you would like to have a looping in the XDP program. Yes. So just you would have to rewrite all the XDP programs. And, uh, oh, yeah, sure. But you can provide also an, uh, the old one for the compatibility, and it will be just called in loop by the kernel. I think it's probably the simplest solution. So I was trying it initially, and um, the thing is that I wasn't skipping the verifier in that approach, and the programs were too big. I imagine that on more complex programs, you might also have benefits. Sorry, once again? I imagine that on more complex programs, you might have benefits from doing stuff in bulk, even within the program itself. So doing both yeah, so basically so multiple stage, paths. Stage programs. Yeah. This is a VPP. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, yeah, yeah, that's right. Anyone else have any questions? I right, thank you very much.